in this presentation, we're going to talk, talk about and walk through some of the examples in refrigeration wiring diagrams. Now, every system is going to be a little bit different. So again, these are just examples to a little bit show you how refrigeration wiring diagrams look. Okay, this is one example of a refrigeration wiring diagram. This area up here on the left, this is a commercial defrost time clock. Okay, it has a clutch solenoid in it, which is right where my mouse pointer is. And it has pins 1, 2, N, 4, 3, and X. X goes to the uh, termination side of my defrost thermostat. 4 is my evaporator fan and my compressor contacts. Okay. And then my compressor and my condenser are here controlled on a contactor, which is labeled C. Okay, so this is a commercial diagram with an electric defrost heater. And we have my defrost limit here. Again, whenever I have an de electric defrost heater, I have to have a limit switch. Fan cycling occurs in low ambient control, so this is called a low ambient control. Okay, all commercial refrigerators will have at least six components. We have a compressor, we have a condenser fan, we have an evaporator fan, we have some sort of starting relay, we have a start capacitor, we have a thermostat, and we have a compressor overload. Okay, three loads and three starting accessories. This drawing is a minimum requirement components required for a single phase medium temperature refrigerator. I have to have a thermostat to control the box. Have a start capacitor, okay, that uses either a potential relay or some other, it could have a current coil relay, but we usually have a start capacitor. We have our compressor with a run start and common winding. We have a condenser fan that's most often a shaded pole, and we have an evaporator fan. Thermostat calls for cooling. In other words, it gets warm, closes, energizes um, my compressor, run winding, and my start winding until enough back EMF is generated to close to energize the potential relay and taking the start winding out of the motor. This is a CSIR motor. At the same time, we energize my condenser fan. Evaporator fan in a commercial system runs constantly. Okay, when the contactor is used, the thermostat is replaced by the contacts of the contactor. If it is two pole contacts, the second set of contacts are placed on the L2 neutral, so the compress to the condenser and the compressor. The thermostat and safety controls are wired in series with the contact coil. Again, evaporator fan runs constantly. Thermostat, high pressure, low pressure contactor. This is for a much heavier system where the thermostat cannot handle the amperage demands of the compressor and condenser fan. Thermostat controls this all because of the contactor down here. This is the type of diagram we want to see drawn when you're drawing stuff for class assignments and we want to see everything labeled. We want to see pin designations, and we want to see the internal wiring of the motors. We don't just want a circle for the motor. If a liquid line solenoid is used, the thermostat controls the solenoid. So in this case, thermostat closes, energizes the solenoid coil, which opens a, line, a refrigeration line. Once the pressure comes up, it closes the contactor. This is for a pump-down system, and then energizes the compressor and condenser fan. As with all commercial systems, the evaporator fan runs constantly. This is a commercial freezer wiring diagram. Okay, so it's going to be a little bit different because we do not want ice to build up and cause problems on the evaporator fan or on the evaporator. So we have to have the defrost up here on the left hand side. So again, we use a defrost time control. There are two types of timers. One is time on, time off. The other is time on and temperature off. The one on the left here is your time and time. The one on the right is the time and temperature. Notice the X terminal. 
Terminal identifications often change among manufacturers, so you have to look and understand the operation based on the different types. Before adding controls and motors, you need to understand the basics. Timer motors on as soon as the power is supplied. The normally closed contacts, in this case 1 and 4, are for cooling. The normally open contacts, 2 to 3, are for defrost. The oval between 1 and 2 down here represents a jumper that can be removed for certain applications. This is a timer is a time temperature off or terminated with the X terminal that's connected to a drop solenoid which changes the switch context back to cooling. So again, all cooling stuff comes off of pin 4. All defrost stuff comes off of pin 3. And this has one purpose. X is a connection from X to a DTT, which is a temperature actuated switch that senses the coil is cool that allows X to connect to neutral. Add each system to the wire and diagram separately. First, we put in all of our cooling components. Then we start adding our defrost components. And then we add our defrost termination. And we use DTS to start the fan after defrost. Notice this drop from the L2 side of the evaporator fan comes down to the high side. Or to the, well, it's upside down. So it's to the cold side of the DTS. Okay, so then we add the, now this would be for an electric defrost, okay. And the defrost components are added. If the contactor is used to operate the compressor, the thermostat and safety control are wired in series with the contactor coil. Notice, 4 comes down to T, T stat, LP, HP, and a contactor coil, and that is what energizes my CNC and my compressor and condenser fan. If a liquid line solenoid is used, the thermostat will control the solenoid, and the low pressure control will turn off the compressor when the pressure drops after the thermostat opens and it de energizes a low, the LLS closing the solenoid, causing the unit to pump down. A pump down system, all it does is put the, removes all the refrigerant from the evaporator and puts it into a, uh, puts it into holding in the condenser on the system, okay? And then it basically prevents liquid slugging back to the compressor, uses the condenser and the receiver. If no contactors used, the low pressure and other safety controls will be wired with the series with the compressor package. Notice here, I don't use any, any contactor, but these are all wired here. So when the pressure drops, when the liquid line solenoid is closed, my low pressure will open and shutting off the condenser and compressor package. If the condensing unit is outside, or if a fan cycle is needed, this is why the fan cycle is wired in series with the condenser fan. So again, it's put with on the on the load side of C and C, but it's wired in series very specifically with the condenser fan. Remember, when developing wire diagrams, work with each system one at a time. Don't try to do everything all at once. You want to start with line, add the defrost clock, and then go and add in each system at one time. After all systems are drawn, check sequence of operation to see if all systems operate properly. Draw and being able to draw schematics and understand schematic diagrams is the difference between a great technician and a mechanic. So refer back to these diagrams over a period of time as you complete the rest of this course so that you actually see the different configurations that we just went through. These are good diagrams to also keep once you get into the field.